Okay, I'll call the meeting to order for the 6 p.m. meeting this evening, our regular in our regular monthly board meeting, uh, which is being held on a Wednesday versus Thursday. Um, will the secretary please call the roll, please? Director Swang, Sethi? Here. Weed? Here. Akbari? Here. And Gunther? Here. Okay, let's see. I'll, you know what? I'll do the salute to flag again. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic which is stands, one nation, here on the visible liberty and justice. <clears throat> Um, General Manager, some housekeeping tips? Absolutely. <clears throat> On behalf of the ACWD Board of Directors, I'd like to welcome the public's participation in this board meeting. My name is Ed Stevenson, and I serve as the district's general manager. Members of the public may participate in this board meeting in person or remotely by either using the Zoom application or by telephone. Any member of the public present in person who wishes to make comments may approach the speaker's podium at the appropriate time. For those participating remotely, note the meeting that the meeting agenda, staff reports, and presentation materials for this meeting are all available on the district's website at acwd.org. You may reference the instructions at the top of the agenda for how to participate using the controls in the Zoom app or your dial pad if participating by telephone audio. This board meeting is being recorded and will be available to the public for future viewing. Again, thank you all for attending, and President Gunther, that completes my housekeeping remarks. Okay, and let us move on to item number three, public comments. And I don't see any members of the public online. And, and we do have a member of the public-ish, another, our sister agency in Newark, who's here to support one of the items on the agenda. But obviously, welcome to make any Public comment. Okay. okay. All right. Um, then we will move on with no public comments. We'll move on to the consent calendar. Um, I would like to just uh, suggest that we might uh, pull item 5.5 .5 from recommended for consent. Yes. I was just going to ask that. Great. Thank you. So staff recommends uh, adding items 5.1, 5.2, 5.3, and 5.4 to the consent calendar. And we have a motion to add items 5.1, or we have a staff recommendation. Is there a motion? The amendment uh, I'll make the motion. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Um, Director Swang? Zephy? Aye. Weed? Aye. Akbari? Aye. And Gunther? Aye. Uh, do we have a motion to move the consent calendar as amended? Moved. Second. Motion and a second. Secretary Alvarola? Director Swang? Sethi? Aye. Weed? Aye. Here. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Akbari? Aye. And Gunther? Aye. Right. Trying to get this thing loaded. All right. Um, so, item... President Gunther, on item 5.5, yes. um, I live within proximity to these projects that are going on. And although I'm not right within the boundary to force myself to recuse, recuse myself from the meeting, I'm close enough. That as I've done in the past, I wish to abstain. It's fine. Okay. So I won't even make a motion here. Okay. Somebody else. Um, well, then is staff ready to uh, proceed? Sure, absolutely. And staff is happy to um, uh, read the summary in the staff report for item 5.5, which, which is authorization of change order and resolution accepting completion of the Kirtner Road Booster Station upgrade project and Washington Booster Station flow meter project. And I'll just say, um, I struggled with whether, whether to leave this on recommended for consent anyway, because I always think it's great to be able to recognize the accomplishments. And this was a big series of projects and uh, we're very happy to make these recommendations this evening. So we'd be happy to talk about that or the board can take action uh, on staff's recommendation. Um, we some motion? Uh, I'll, I'll make the motion to adopt staff recommendation. And I'll second. Uh, we have a motion and a second. We'd love to talk about the project, but it could be a potentially long night. So. <laughs> <laughs> Director Swamp, Sethi? Abstain. Weed? Aye. 
Akbari. Aye. And Gunther. Aye. Moving on to item 5.6. Yep, item 5.6 is authorization to execute a cooperative agreement for water main renewal design and construction work associated with the city of Newark's Old Town streetscape and main renewal project. And this is the, the item that Diana Kanko from the city of Newark is here in case there are any questions, uh, but I'll let Mr. Awoke uh, um, introduce the item. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Good evening, board members, uh, community or <laughs> partner city member um, and uh, staff. Um, in the past, the district has partnered with the cities in our service area on projects that help improve district infrastructure while providing mutual benefits. The city of Newark has recently received state and federal funding for a streetscape project along Thornton Avenue in central Newark. Staff believes it's in the best interest of the district to incorporate the design and construction of the waterline relocation within the streetscape project. Doing so will help the district optimize our main renewal efforts and minimize impacts to our customers, residents, and businesses along the corridor. I will go ahead and read the summary of the staff report and staff's recommendation, but I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you may have. And as Mr. Stevenson indicated, Ms. Dana Conco is also with the city of Newark and uh, I'm sure she'll be happy to answer your questions. <clears throat> The city of Newark is planning to construct the Old Town Streetscape Improvements Project, which includes reconstruction of Thornton Avenue between Ash Street and Cherry Street, Derry Avenue between Thornton Avenue and Sycamore Street, Sycamore Street between Derry Avenue and Thornton Avenue, and Magnolia Street between Thornton Avenue and Rich Avenue, and adjacent areas with new curb, gutter, sidewalk, pavement section, stormwater infrastructure, and landscaping, which we collectively call City Project. A cooperative agreement has been prepared to provide for a joint effort between the city and the district to complete the design and construction of the water system improvements as part of the city project. The agreement addresses cost sharing responsibilities and respective roles of the district and the city to complete the design and construction of all these improvements. This item was reviewed with the Engineering and Information Technology Committee on May 1st, 2024. Board authorization of these services will help meet the district's strategic plan goal 1.1, which is efficiently manage and maintain our infrastructure to ensure reliability. Staff's recommendation is by motion, authorize the general manager to execute a cooperative agreement with the city of Newark for water main design and construction work for the old town streetscape and main renewal project and city of Newark project number P1258. Thank you. I have some comments. So, um, having been recently out to the uh, Newark State of the City address, which was in the heart of this old downtown, and having visited it hundreds of times growing up, I think that what Newark is doing is an extremely important project for the entire community and the rehabilitation of the old town center. Um, our project simply complements all of the other investments that the city of Newark is making. And so I compliment you and your own staff on um, having a very, very thorough set of design improvements that will make it a very walkable and enjoyable place for folks to uh, uh, walk daytime, nighttime, dining, shopping, everything that you're doing in terms of improvements. So the streetscape improvements, the underlying facilities for water and sewer are really important too and one of the oldest sections of the Tri-City area. And uh, so I'm very pleased to see this project moving forward. It's one of the two most important main renewal projects we have, or three in the district, Niles Alvarado, Driscoll, and, and this one. And so I'm happy to make a motion in favor of this, but I wanted to get my comments in quickly. Thank you. I'll second the motion. <laughs> motion is second. Uh, further comments, uh, Director Akbari? Um, I would like to say I'm fairly certain this has come before committing with myself and Director Wong. We, uh, we certainly know the difficulty that this is going to present to everyone. I mean, Thornton is a fairly major thoroughfare, we'll just say. Um, 
we have some, the district staff has some experience over on Alvarado Niles. Uh, I can't vote on that project because it's too close to my house. Um, and uh, we did pretty good. Uh, we got another phase coming up for that one. Um, we're working on doing Driscoll over in Fremont and Thornton and Newark. So we're touching all the bases. Um, we definitely will work very closely with the city of Newark, make sure this thing goes down good. And it's a nice project. Thank you. Uh, further comments? And I'm not seeing any members of the public online. And so if there are any comments to be made, right. now would be the time. Would you care to make a comment or are you good? <laughs> Sorry, Diana. <laughs> good evening. My name is Diana Kanko. I'm with uh, City of Newark the... as a principal civil engineer. Um, I wasn't prepared to make any comments tonight. <laughs> I was hoping to just sneak in and sneak out. Um, but I wanted to say that uh, we appreciate your support. Um, this is a very important project for the city of Newark. It is one that has been in um, planning stage for a long time. And um, it is very important to our businesses and to our residents out there that this come to fruition. And we appreciate uh, staff for partnering with uh, or considering to partner with us. It is going to be a very challenging project given that Thornton is a very heavily traveled arterial street with truck routes. <laughs> but um, I am uh, very confident that our staff uh, will work through those challenges. Um, so I, I appreciate the kind words and support that you guys made tonight and um, appreciate your support on this project. Thank you. Great. Yeah. And maybe as a member of the public, I'll make a quick comment. I'll make two. One is appreciate Diana coming down here. Um, and I actually tried to hire Diana at one time, <laughs> but she was well-grounded in the city of Newark. And, and that's great because uh, she's doing a great job over there. And we are very much in alignment in many of our priorities with the city of Newark and, and opportunities to cooperate like this are great and they benefit um, our collective customers and, and constituents. So these are great opportunities and we appreciate the partnership with Newark. Well, with no more comments, um, we have a motion. We have a second. I believe it is on the table. Secretary, call the roll. Director Swan. Sethi. Aye. Weed. Aye. And Mari. Aye. And Gunther. Aye. We on 5.7. Okay, item 5.7 is authorization of reserve appropriation based, up, based on estimated increases in water purchase and capital expenditures for fiscal year 2023-24. And for this item, I'll turn it over to Mr. Wonderling. Great. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Uh, good evening, members of the board, uh, staff and public. Last June, the board approved the budget as well as 25 year capital improvement program. And as it relates to this particular item, the most uh, relevant action from last June is that the board authorized expenditure of $181.9 million for the current fiscal year across all district programs and activities. Based on actual expenditures to date, as well as planned activities through June 30, uh, the end of the fiscal year, staff does anticipate that expenditures will exceed the approved budget for fiscal year 2023-24. Uh, of course, we'll review that in much more detail at the board budget workshop plan for next week. But uh, the two main areas where we're looking, uh, it looks like we'll be over budget is uh, first, in San Francisco Public Utilities Commission water use, uh, we're looking at approximately $7 million uh, due to an additional 3,000 acre feet of water purchases. And there are a number of factors that have contributed to that. Uh, that includes unplanned and extended facility outages, uh, winter surface water treatment challenges due to low water temperatures uh, that resulted in lower production at the surface water treatment plant, um, as well as uh, additional water to meet water quality blending objectives. And additionally, uh, we had uh, an extended period on local supplies during this fiscal year while SFPUC was working on its own capital improvements and, and that required some additional purchases to meet uh, hardness targets because the local source water from San Francisco uh, is harder than the, their source water from Hetch Hetchy. 
Uh, the other area where we're looking at some additional expenditures within the fiscal year is in the capital program. That's about 3 million. And that's largely due to the advanced metering infrastructure project. Uh, it's not due to project cost overruns. The project is not costing us any more than, than we've expected or has previously been presented to the board, but rather um, there had previously in the project been some delays due to discovery of a protected species and the project team has been able to recover much of that schedule. And actually uh, I received an update earlier today from our customer service team that the project is 99.75% complete. Uh, and so uh, with recovery of that schedule, it means more of the expenditures have been moved up into this fiscal year. So there'd be corresponding lower expenses in subsequent fiscal years. Uh, so that's a distinction from the San Francisco situation, which is truly an, an additional cost uh, to buy more water this year. So, um, you know, that all adds up to a reserve appropriation of 10.3 million that's being requested. And, you know, that's kind of a conservative top end estimate, the authority that we're requesting. We do expect to have savings and other line items of the budget that would result in a need for a lower amount of expenditures, you know, relative to the total budget authority. Um, but given, you know, uncertainty and projecting with that level of preciseness, we are asking for this maximum level. And so, um, uh, so that's kind of an overview of what's going on there. Uh, revenue and expenditure estimates, along with draft budget revisions, were also reviewed with committee uh, April 16th. And approval of this will help meet strategic plan goal 3.3, promote financial transparency. So the recommendation is by motion, authorize a reserve appropriation in the amount of 10.3 million for additional water purchase and capital expenditures for fiscal year 2023-24. And uh, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. For public attendance, so Director Sethi, no questions. Me? No. <clears throat> Questions? Do we have a motion? I'll make the motion to adopt staff recommendation. Motion. Do we have a second? Second. No. Second. Secretary, call the roll, please. Director Spong? Sethi? Aye. Weed? Aye. Akbari? Aye. And Gunther? Aye. John 5.8. Authorization for agreement for service line inventory identification services. Correct. And for this item, I will ask our interim director of operations and maintenance, Mr. Wickham, to introduce this item. Good evening, directors, members of public. Uh, this is uh, authorization of agreement for service line inventory identification services. So the lead and copper rule revisions, or LCRR, require utilities to identify the material type for all customer and utility side service lines within their service area by October 16th, 2024. The district is building an inventory through field identifications conducted by Professional Meters, Inc., or PMI, which is a subcontractor for Badger Meters during the installation of new water meters as part of the uh, Advanced Metering Infrastructure Project. This work was approved by the board as a change order in June of 2021. Once the AMI project is complete, the district anticipates having to identify the material types for up to 6,000 additional service lines that were not addressed under the change order. The district requested and has received a quotation from PMI for the field identification of up to 6,000 service lines, both the customer and utility side, uh, and collecting and recording the data in the amount of $220,920. Given the district's experience with PMI, staff recommends entering into a single source agreement with PMI to perform this work. Authorization of this agreement will facilitate the completion of the water service line inventory by the regulatory required date of October 16th, 2024. There's adequate funding within the district's fiscal year 2024-25 budget for this expenditure and board authorization of the, this agreement will help meet the district's strategic plan goal 1.2, continue to meet water quality standards 100% of the time. Our recommendation is to authorize the general manager to enter into an agreement for service line inventory identification services, Professional Meters Inc., in an amount not to exceed two hundred twenty thousand nine hundred and twenty dollars. <throat> I'll start. So this item was discussed in our uh, uh, operations and water quality meeting yesterday, and um, 
I'm thoroughly supportive of this inventory effort that we're doing. Uh, congratulate everybody on staff and our partner, EMI, on accelerating the deployment of our AMI units. It's really wonderful news. And um, so I will move the staff recommendation on this. If, no, no further comments. Let's see if we have a second to get it on the table, and I have some questions. Uh, I'll second. Um, the analysis, will it determine the estimate, the length of the service line as well as the material being used? Uh, no, sir. This would be strictly a materials identification. Will there be an effort to distinguish for, for galvanized pipe and the size of the galvanized pipe? Yes, if it's galvanized, that could require replacement, yes. Um, so the, the inventory categories are lead, non-lead, and galvanized requirement replacement. Does it give an estimate on the age of the um, installation? No, um, not, not necessarily. Uh, this inventory would be uh, conducted by field visits, uh, me, visual inspections, including. Uh, let me encourage you, particularly for galvanized, to try and have an estimate of the age of the pipe, because we fairly well know that if it's 30 years and galvanized, it's gonna fail. Um, so you have at least some point of, and the amount of the failure increases over time. So the older the pipe, the replacement strategy should probably be coordinated with that. Yeah, we can talk um, um, internally about whether we wanna try and capture some additional information, but the, the purpose of this effort isn't to determine like the life expectancy of the private side service line or any, or condition. It's really to comply with the lead and copper rule revisions, which require that we identify the material. If it's galvanized, then um, some additional work is in order in terms of determining whether there was any lead upstream of it at any one point. Um, so th that's the kind of information that we have to collect and, and report. Um, but we can talk about whether there are other types of information we think we should have for our purposes. Today, do we allow new galvanized to go into the system for service lines? No, so not on not on the public side. On the private side, there's still galvanized going in. It's still allowed. I believe so. I encourage you to review that practice. Uh, I noticed that when we do do the service lines on most of the projects. It was a non-ferrous uh, line that was being put in. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are significant advantages to that. Yeah, I think the most common is um, plastic or PVC or, um, or copper. There's a, almost like a rubberized line that I saw put in a black, uh, mm -hmm. whether that's a plastic or a, yeah. some type of composite material. Yeah, that's, that's PEX. Don't ask me what the E or the X stand for. <laughs> I think it's so, polyethylene something or other. Okay, and service lines are going to be the major, one of our major problems with water loss. And the more information we can collect in your survey, the better off we are. And if we're going to be serving it to begin with, I encourage you to look at ways we can increase it. Also, when we put in an ADU, look at the full service line to the property to see if uh, as part of the ADU approval process, we'd want to uh, encourage the replacement of the service line. There are neighborhoods in this town where you, you go through and you're going to find extraordinary water losses because of the galvanized service lines. Mm -hmm. We do have a requirement to reduce non-revenue water. Fortunately, it's revenue because it's on the correct side of the meter. And we're shooting ourselves in the foot. All right, thank you. You're trying to fart. I also had the opportunity to be on the committee. This was recorded. It's a fascinating um, piece of legislation. Um, we are lucky that we were able to tie our AMI project to this puppy. That price tag would have been phenomenally higher if it hadn't been for the fact we're in there touching every meter. 
We only missed, I think it's 6,000. Um, phenomenal amount of money we saved. Uh, and we're going to have to do it. Fed said so. So thank you, staff. Further comments? Secretary, call the roll. Director Swan. Sethi? Aye. Weed? Aye. Akbari? Aye. And Gunther? Aye. Let's see. Swan, I think that's the end of the agenda. That's the end of the action calendar. Next up would be board committee reports and staffs uh, didn't plan on highlighting anything in particular, but we're certainly available to answer any questions. Comments? Artist map looks incredibly good because we're using a lot of Hetch Hetchy water. <laughs> um, the, the water in uh, in Mission San Jose and Warm Springs is softer than mm -hmm. from the desal plant right now. <laughs> is that still running from because of the uh, Delta still? Water quality of the Delta driving it soft? This, uh, the April hardness, sir, is. Uh, PP2 is out of service, so this would, would oh. be reflective of uh, SFPUC water SFP and, and blender and diesel. So. I, I do have one um, <clears throat> subject that I'd like to bring up real quick on the water production report. Mm -hmm. So we've had a, we had kind of a warmer winter than normal, and we're having a cool spring. Even the forecast outlook is we're cooler than normal, you know, April and May. And so our uh, water demands for each month of this year are below our forecasts. And as we've discussed in our finance committee meeting, we're starting to diverge this year between the incoming revenues, even after we uh, had the rate increase adjustment. And uh, I'm sorry, did I say that right? decreasing revenues at the same time that we're having increasing costs. So we're building up a delta of uh, increasing losses per month on our f financials. And I think that when we go into our budget discussions, we need to have a serious discussion about where um, we can reduce costs a little bit. I'm not gonna make any suggestions here but we should be able to touch upon a variety of topics in, in those uh, workshops. It's starting to get me a little worried right now. Yeah, if you look at those bars, pretty low. Okay, then uh, staff presentations? No staff presentations this evening. Uh, General Manager's report. Uh, I had one quick item. It's hot off the presses. Uh, tomorrow there will be a uh, uh, a special meeting by the Delta Conveyance Project, um, where th there'll be information provided about um, an updated cost estimate as well as uh, the uh, cost and benefits analysis. And uh, it will be broadcast on the web. <clears throat> I will send the board out a link to that meeting if you'd like to participate. It'll be tomorrow. And we expect that there'll be uh, quite a bit of media interest and there'll be a number of interests that are, in, are going to be interested in this and watching this closely. Um, uh, the, there'll be a, a press conference at 11 a.m. Um, we are coordinating with the Delta Conveyance Project to... Uh, have them provide you all with a presentation over the next couple of meetings, um, hopefully, um, so that we can, you know, have a, a discussion about the information that they'll be providing uh, starting tomorrow. So just a quick update on that. I'll furnish some addition, additional information via email. And that's the only report that I have this evening. Okay. Right. Just a moment, if I could follow up on Director Sethi's comments really on the prior item on rates and uh, income. I would note that the other issue which hits this year is this year is the loss of the surcharge. We play the games because of a dysfunctional rate structure. We don't match income, fixed income with fixed uh, expenses and variable income with variable expenses. Therefore, we get into this whipsaw effect. And it's unfortunate and it's really bad management practice. I do believe we'll be Thank discussing you. this. Near future. Um, 
Okay, I believe we're into director comments. Uh, director Seth, you want to start us off with the Delta conveyance? Yeah, I'll make it quick here. So the uh, DCFA had presentations from uh, the Delta uh, the Design and Construction Authority on their schedule and cost estimates right now. And we also had a discussion um, with their legal counsel, this was done in public session, um, about the fact that they were nearing filing a their formal appeal on the validation lawsuit. Um, I was able to sit down in the morning with Executive Director Graham Bradner last week at Aqua, and he informed me that that appeal now has formally been filed and that they would get a copy to the DCFA members and other participants in the project. So that's forthcoming. And we also made a decision to reduce the number of meetings that we're having from bi-monthly to uh, three a year right now until we have a clear indication of what the actual financing authority can do in financing terms, what, what's legal, where we can reduce risk in terms of being sued and those kind of things. So our next meeting is going to be in October. And the reason we timed it for October is that Metropolitan, which is half the project, is uh, going to be making some key decisions, hopefully, by September in terms of whether they want to support a low, medium, or more aggressive uh, funding case over the next three years. <clears throat> so that's my report for ECFA. Yeah. Questions? No. Um, on the DCA um, Design and Construction Authority, we've had some sessions. We have another meeting tomorrow. Or should, um, yes, tomorrow. The um, preliminary uh, numbers I've heard really relate to the time of execution of the project. The longer the project is run out, the more the expenses, the fact that we're getting involved in litigation and having to go through appeals, which do not have a definitive timeline on them, raise the risk that this will be drawn out even further. And therefore, they call, and depending on the level of effort, will directly re be reflected in the total cost, of which ours is only 1%. But don't be surprised if it increases by at least uh, almost a third. And uh, this in this tranche, as, it, as the project gets kicked down farther and farther down the road, those costs will only increase. I'll make two other real quick comments. One was that um, there is an eagerness on the part of all 11 board members to learn what is going on. And um, as chair and the vice chair of Met, we're elected officials, so is Santa Clara. But for the most part, everyone else is a general manager or assistant general manager. And um, so it's really valuable when we can come together and hear from the people directly working with the project where they are. Number two, I, I did close the meeting under director's remarks with that remarkable trip I talked about last month on the Water Education Foundation Lower Colorado River Tour over multiple days and um, and how valuable it was for me as chair of this authority to be able to interface with all of the Southern California interests because we only have three that are from um, a Northern Bay area. The other eight are all from Southern California, including Metropolitan. And the fact that I was able to interface, be on, have boots on the ground in their own territory, talk to their own board members, staff members, I can't tell you how much these general managers were thrilled. It was like, we're glad you came out and you understand our situation or situations. So um, it was nice to meet in person up in Sacramento. My second report I'll give first uh, on Aqua. I attended three days, Tuesday through Thursday. Tuesday, I was busy with water management, local government, uh, and some side meetings on Los Vaqueros Reservoir. 
And um, <clears throat> so uh, not much to report except on local government where we've reestablished our charter. We now have five major goals that we're going to work on. But the two most significant are on all the uh, additional housing requirements in urban dense areas, housing density. Uh, and uh, in particular, everybody's worried about ADUs right now and how water and wastewater agencies deal with setting up proper ordinances for water and sewage line hookups and everything like that. And the second is on paving issues. And uh, these two are kind of complementary in the fact that they are multi-agency uh, type projects when you're dealing with any one of these issues. So um, we, We've actually had some really good subcommittee meetings on these topics. I'm surprised at how generous people are with their time, especially people from the legal community and people from public works departments, um, whether it's municipal or water sewer. So uh, I did give a report on the Region 5 meeting on the progress on all these things. And then I thought the highlight of the, uh, although I did go to a number of sessions, the best one for me was the one on the Delta with uh, former Aqua President Randy Record, with uh, Chair Ortega from MET. Um, and the more I hear about what MET's position is, its investments in the Delta, where it thinks things should go, not only from my water education trips, but this one is aqua sessions as well. Uh, it was really, really informative. And I, it gives me some level of optimism. And when the governor came in to speak to us um, and reiterated his position and wants to aggressively move forward, that was exciting to hear. And you could tell the frustration in Governor Newsom, just like we saw with Governor Brown, that the Sierra Club and the environmental groups are not acting responsibly. And that uh, the, the sequel reforms that he got through the legislature last year, the only major project that was not included with those reforms was the Delta conveyance system. And here we are being dragged out forever on what multiple people were saying is, uh, and even our former Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court, when she spoke, she said, this is the lifetime employment agreement for attorneys at the Sierra Club and uh, all the other environmental groups that are fighting these cases. So I was glad to hear administration people, including Crowfoot and, and others and the governor really say, hey, we, we've got to move beyond this. We need to get projects done in California again. So I thought it was really good. Our dinner was even better. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah. Well, first of all, I also attended the JPI meeting in the uh, day and a half prior to the Aqua meeting. Um, they are no, they're, Staying within reasonable um, expectations and uh, sort of a, a good deal. You can get insurance from the. I did make a suggestion that given the number of insurance companies that are bailing from California, I just learned a uh, business owner's policy I have will not be renewed on the property in the, the mission area uh, because the company's leaving the market. Uh, that one company which does uh, is holding on is USAA, but they're limited to military veterans and military service. So my suggestion was that someone contact USAA and see if they will expand their membership pool to the employees of uh, public agencies, particularly water districts, given the same um, 
character and professionalism of the um, of the potential constituents. The reason USAA has been positive is that they restrict they have the military code of conduct grilled into their customer base. So it's worked. Director Weed, I just read that USAA got an F on their recent credit report card because of lawsuits against them abusing people's checking account privileges and things like that. So a Wells Fargo situation all over again. And their their credit rating has, has been dropped down to BBB. Well, we'll see. We know if we have AAA, they're too conservative. So uh, <laughs> hopefully somewhere in the middle. But USA has turned out, to my experience, has been extraordinary. But we'll see what the insurance business can be incredibly volatile. Um, and the conference was mentioned, Federal Affairs, that Aqua has dropped out of the NWRA. And they mentioned issues related to transparency. It was sure a uh, euphemism for some internal personnel problems within the leadership of NWRA. Um, there were discussions now that PFAS have come under CERCLA. I would note, it was noted that, uh, and I give credit to Hanson Bridget for then their analysis of the PFAS um, EPA uh, criteria and putting it under CERCLA that it was noted that EPA really doesn't have the last say in this. Anyone can sue. We've opened it up. And the LA and CERCLA is Liabilities Act. You know, often joint and severable. Bottom line, avoid recycled water as, as far away from it as you can. Because recycled water, I think, is shared documentation is a de novo generator of PFAS. Um, and that's could come down the pike. It's one of those issues that's kind of hit us. And there's now under CERCLA is something one of it. Um, so next on, on the Delta, which is really the big issue. Corps of Engineers gave a prognosis there almost 30 years ago that the Delta was doomed to be an inland salt and sea. If you think in terms of the five levels of grief when you have a terminal uh, patient, you go from denial to anger, negotiations, despair, and resignation. What struck me coming out of this conference is how we have parties that are covering all five levels of those levels of grief. <laughs> the representatives from the, uh, the supervisor from the north of the Delta is still in denial. Um, some are showing anger. Most are in, um, they want to negotiate, but there's some of us who are in resignation uh, mode and ready to um, push the conveyance mechanism as hard as we can. Thank you. I also attended, and um, first, I think the highlight was really the governor's energy. Um, he was not on the agenda, Secretary Crowfoot brought him in. Um, wonder how much the staff knew at that point, whether he was coming or not. But anyway, talk about pushing for project. Um, and that one of the things that he did say to us was everything possible to get the permits. You know, we're not gonna be able to fight the lawyers. They're, we're gonna get sued. I mean, anybody associated with this project, they know the way to delay it and to kill it is to sue. So you just have to fight it. Um, I went to the session where, yes, the you know the, the guy from Elk Grove, the elected official, they're still, huh? The tribes, no. Still a lot of no out there. And it's easy to say no. Really easy to say no. It's not going to fix it. And I think the governor's frustration was that. And he's going to push it. It was very, very comforting to hear him say that. I mean, that, that one of the few conferences I've come away from where it's like, man, there's hope. You always have hope. Pandora opened the box twice. So 
hope came out that second time. You know, what I really liked about his <clears throat> presentation is that he didn't divide California in quadrants or in half. He spoke to the urban interests as well as the ag interests north of Sacramento Valley and South Salt and San Joaquin Valley. And it's clear to everyone in the audience when he got the applause that he did is that Sierra, the Sierra Club is public enemy number one, uh, along with the National Defense Council and all of these other groups that are suing us. Right now we're tangled up in close to nine, nine different lawsuits, including the major one that DWR is dealing with on, on validation. And the fact is they've kept things protracted for decades. It's not just a couple of years or five years. We, as a district here, we, we built a fish ladder. I know some of us don't agree on it, but we worked with everybody. Instead of suing everybody, we worked with everybody and we got results. Um, their objective is to sue that we give up. That's the objective, that's my opinion. Well, so, I'm gonna be honest with people here. I was a long time member of the Sierra Club from the time I was a teenager and I quit after I realized that most of my money was not going to save parks and recreation and things for membership. If you look at the Sierra Club budget, it's public, go take a look at it. It's mostly going to pay for legal legal fees, legal bills. Um, and it's it's like its own law firm now. And one of our, our board, our original board president, Joseph Shin, he was one of the first founders of the Sierra Club, along with Charles Howard Shin, his brother, and uh, part of the original team of people that founded Sierra Club. So it's a great disappointment when I remember my childhood and growing up as a teenager, we got projects done in California. Oroville was built in less than eight years. San Luis was built in about six or seven years. The Golden Gate Bridge, like Newsom was talking about was built in less like eight years, something like that. Six years under budget, under cost, under schedule. We need to think big again. And um, we can't be, you know, fighting in court forever. I went to the Sigma meeting because I just like to know a little bit more. One of the interesting things that came out of the Sigma meeting was that you don't think about is funding. You know, they, they form these agencies, but there was no funding mechanism for these, these groups and they had to put it together and they, they're really having a challenge. Um, and that's because that, there's no money that's been set aside to fund the agencies. Well, we're going to do this, but who's going to pay for it? Then they've got issues with Prop 29, apparently, and Prop 218 funding notices that have lost. So they, they've got a real challenge out there in the basins. <laughs> cybersecurity, I can't talk about it. Um, no, I did, I did go to the cybersecurity one. Uh, fascinating on what the uh, latest um, interesting threats seem to be heading. Um, let's see, moving on because of the Dodger game, I'll get off cybersecurity. Uh, Delta conveyance, um, I went to the Delta conveyance once. Weather whiplash. Uh, well, first, the Delta conveyance, there was something I heard that I had not heard before. We lost, they said, maybe Leonard, 900,000 acre feet of diversion this year. Not because of the Delta spell. Steelhead. And think about it. This year, we had a pretty darn good water year. And we lost 900,000 acre feet. Diversion because they had to shut the pumps down because the steelhead were too close. Probably came from us. <laughs> Fish ladder's working well, we said. But uh, no, that's, and that was one of the things about the Delta th project is had this thing been built, we wouldn't have lost that water. Well, it's, you know, on the last field trip that Director Wheat and I took out there, Aqua um, field trip, their region or whatever it is. Um, the question that kept popping into my mind, I think John recognized it also, is why are they not building much bigger fish ladders 
up of these canals that are feeding the pumps. So they've got these long, narrow canals that come in off the delta. And we're doing a good job with fish ladders. We went to the fish ladder factory. Um, and it seems like the technology is there to prevent even the smallest fish from getting to the pumps. I don't know why we're not investing in that. That was the one that really shocked me. That, and uh, but it was a great presentation. Um, <clears throat> and the weather whiplash one was interesting because I, I missed last year's spring conference, and I realized sitting in the weather whiplash though that the spring conference last year we still didn't know. And so it was a very interesting recap on stuff that occurred last year and how um, response, how the response went, um, the concepts of having to change regulations. The fact that it could have been a lot worse. Everybody forgot that we had a very mild spring and cooler, the snow melt stayed. That could have been a horrible disaster with floods, but it wasn't. So, um, listening to Met is great. Hearing those guys talk, I think um, I, I I hope they stay strong because you know I we have to. We really, we really have to, because we need to get this project. I think it needs to be built. Um, the sessions, but the sessions were not totally negative. There was hope. Hopefully we can move forward and get something done. Now if we can only build a rear. We'll a see. Quick comment on the, uh, what I call the spin. I recall when the Delta Conveyance Project was pitched in, in, uh, in response to the environmental concerns and those who were anti-growth that this would send water to Southern California. The argument was, oh, it's only for water quality. No new or additional water supply. It was just to take the current run. So now that has, after a drought, has the argument has been modified. The credibility of the whole system can be challenged uh, as the as the sort as the arguments change. One of the arguments they're starting to push now too is flood control. Because oh. if you could pull the water off the Sacramento River up north, when you know you're going to get hammered down by further south, if you let it go, you could pull a fair amount of water off the river if you were to build this project and send it around it. Oh, it um, is a it's a complex issue because the area where they have saltwater intrusion keeps moving upstream as each of the uh, various agreements, um, as the reality sets in. But Dennis Steamer uh, from, not Dennis Steamer, sorry, uh, Dennis Herrera from um, San Francisco PUC made a very insightful uh, letter to the State Water Board pointing out that the other area, the unimpaired flows and voluntary agreements, the whole issue was to try and find ways to substitute the senior water rights of San Francisco, MID, and TID, and the junior water rights of the federal and state governments to try and extend the life of the Delta. Yes. A futile effort in the long run. Uh, at some point, we're going to have to work together. But a lot of money is thrown at these things. Hopefully, we will. Um, further comments? We good. Closed session? Yes, I'm happy to take us into closed session at 6.55, and the board is going to convene into closed session. Item 8.1, pursuant to California Government Code Section 54957, Public Employee Performance Evaluation, title the General Manager. Now convene into closed session. Okay, it's uh, 2030, or 2030, and the board has uh, returned from reviewing the performance evaluation of General Manager uh, Stevenson. No action has been taken. Turning to our legal counsel, the next step. Correct. So the board convened in closed session, reviewed the performance um, 
evaluation of the general manager took no action in that closed session. Now we're back to 9.1. Uh, the open session item and the open session item is to appoint an agency designated representative for labor negotiations between the district and the general manager, an unrepresented employee for a possible amendment to the general manager's employment employment agreement. So at this point, it's, uh, it's up to the board to make a motion to um, appoint the uh, board's agency designated representatives for those negotiations. So. Um, President Gunther, I would like to nominate you as board president and vice president Judy Long as our uh, labor negotiation representatives. I'll second the motion. The motion is second. Um, Secretary Colorado. <coughs> Director Splong? Sethi? Yes. Weed? Aye. Akbari? Aye. And Gunther? Aye. Following on then. Um, Yes, we're going to go back into closed session then. Correct. So it's now 831 and the board is going to convene into closed session pursuant to California government code section 54957.6. Conference with labor negotiators. The agency designated representatives are board president Gunther and vice president Wong. The unrepresented employee is the general manager and the board can now convene into closed session. Okay, the board has returned from closed session and has provided me, the contract labor negotiator, with direction. Uh, Director Wong was not present. And that's my report. And with that, further comments for the board tonight? Having none, we'll declare the meeting adjourned.